Senor Olivas is here. I am here once again, and I guess we're going to talk fights. Is normal. Once again, here we are. <laughs> Always talking fights. Uh, we've got a special guest today, and I'm assuming because it's you, more so because it's me, we're going to have a thousand technical difficulties, and I'm going to be up till 6 a.m. trying to figure this out. Uh, see, even your dog knows. I, I hear your dog pissed off in the background like, hey, <laughs> idiots, push the blue button. Push, like, le, hey, let me in and I'll figure it out for you guys. Um, but before we get into our guests, before we get into fights, uh, Brandon, why do you, why did you sign up to betonline.ag before we ever had a sponsorship? Why'd you do it? I, I signed up for betonline.ag because uh, it's one of the sharpest books. To me, I can, I can view the most action. They have the most fight cards. They have some really, really interesting, really cool bets, like most takedowns, the, the round spreads. There's so many reasons that I love Bet Online. Uh, I think Bet Online is going to make me rich. So uh, it, it's been a great, great book. I really, really love it. And I'm really proud to have them as a sponsor. Um, you know, there's a ton of different sports books out there. And, uh, you know, I think we kind of had our pick on, on which ones we could get behind. And I told you, hey, we, we should reach out to Bet Online and, and have them as our sponsor. So, you know, that, that is, uh, that's where we are. And I'm very happy to have them. Yeah, and we did. We reached out to Bet Online. We talked with them, told them what we were doing, and you know now they sponsor the show, and I'm I'm glad they do. And if you guys use uh, code uh, SDMMA, you guys can get up to a fifty percent sign on bonus for up to a thousand dollars. So you put in five hundred dollars, you get an extra two hundred fifty. You put in a thousand dollars, you get an extra five hundred of free play. Uh, so you guys definitely go sign up for, to BetOnline.ag. Co use code SDMMA. And then also sign up to the uh, sign up to the Patreon. You know we're giving all of our uh, UFC picks. You've got uh, you're on the Discord. You're putting out uh, regional shows, uh, bare knuckle contender. I see you guys did pretty well today on contender. I can never bet contender. I'm always I mean I can, but I'm always at the gym training people, and so I never do anything with contender because Tuesdays are chaos for me, and I never have time to do it earlier. But I want to bet contender. Because you bet contender, because you're not at the gym with me on Tuesday. And a bunch of the people at the gym and people who follow us are winning on contender. And I'm the only one not winning on contender. And I'm here doing this with you, but not on Tuesdays. <laughs> well, don't feel left out anymore. Uh, contender's over now. So we don't have to worry about it. We got what we needed out of it. And uh, now we have more free no, time. No, no, no. To so do hold on. Else. Hold on. Hold on. We didn't get shit. You, well, you and the collective you on the Discord got, but me, I got nothing. All I did was get probably like some rash burn from like somebody's gloves today at the gym. So, hey, I do want to say, guys, uh, if you are going to sign up for the Patreon, make sure that you hop on the Discord too. Um, the Patreon is like UFC picks and stuff like that. But the Discord, you're going to go down a million different avenues, but it's really, really important. Everything is pretty clear and organized. There's different chats. If you have questions, please feel free to ask. Just make sure you're getting on the Discord. That's where a bulk of the information is going to be. Yeah, so UFC picks on uh, Patreon. And you guys know I always do my some early release stuff on the Patreon as well. But all of the regional shows and all of that is on the Discord with uh, Brandon and company. So um, do we have a guest? Do we have a guest? Do we have a guest? Is there one in the waiting room? There is not one in the waiting room, but again, I'm also inept. So there, there probably is one in the waiting room. Um, but said she's in. Oh, really? Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Um, yes, yes, yes. We've gotten you guys. I wish you could see my screen because it doesn't even say a name. It just says. Do, 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 baby shark. <laughs> baby Hello. shark. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Hello, Senora Tabitha Ricci. Hello, guys. She's Brazilian, not Spanish, okay? You can't speak Spanish I don't, to her. Uh, I would have said Senora if she was as white as I was or if she was black or Chinese. Probably especially if she was Chinese. That would make the most sense. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you had the, uh, the stuffed animal at the ready, always. I'm ready, always, always. He sleeps with me. How many stuffed animals did you bring with you this week? Only that one. That one's the special one. <laughs> oh, but so you are you? A lot. Are you already up in uh, Vegas for fight week? Yes, yes, we are already here. We came to the morning. Now, do you like? I know a lot of fighters 
like, like I know like Tracy Cortez, when we're in Phoenix and she fights mm-hmm. here, she will do everything she can to stay at her house until like the day of the fight. And so she'll okay. actually, she'll sleep in her bed all the time. Do you like being out in a way like at the hotels and stuff for fight camp? Does it help or does it feel weird? Would you rather be at your own home or would you rather be in the hotel? Well, I think uh, if I had the opportunity as she had to be at her house as a performer, performance wise, I would rather be in my, my house and on my bed. But I do like to be in the hotel and I do like the energy, my friends around, be with teammates. Uh, so I really enjoy this time. It feels okay, like, now, a, like an event, like a big deal. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. That is what I was going to ask next is, have you, um, and I'm not looking at your record right now to see when you ha, have you fought, have all of your UFC fights been in the apex or have you fought in yes. front of the crowd? Yes. All my UFC fights being in the apex. Feels like oh them. my God. <laughs> I, I need you to fight in front of a crowd because I, I mean, you know, we were in apex forever. I mean, it was years of apex stuff. Mm-hmm. And the first fight that we got a crowd back, I was like, I never want to go to the apex again. I only want to be in front of fans because I love the energy of the fans. Do you like now the apex are starting to let a little bit more people in now Mm -hmm, and they're actually selling mm -hmm. tickets except for this week, except for this week, no media, no fans. Why is that? Do you know? The media is tired. They said, so just no media to this week. (laughs) I'm not kidding. That is crazy. Really? Um, well, okay. Now, do you, do you Tabitha, like, does that you... make your week lighter? If there's no media, make a week. Does that make your week lighter? If there's no media at the apex or you still have to do all the, the lead up stuff, uh, I, even though they're not going to be there. Doing, we're still doing a lot of media. Uh, actually, actually, tomorrow is my business day. I'm going to do seven interviews, but I know that's after fight. We're not going to have the press conference. Oh, oh. yeah. Hmm. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Now, do you like, um, well, one, just after press conference is the only thing I like about the yeah, apex yeah, because yeah. you just like the food, <laughs> the, the food. Yeah. They used to have a green room where we would go eat yes. before COVID and now we don't have a green room anymore. But when we go to I the press thing, that. Oh, I go right up there and I eat all of the press's food. Fortunately, <laughs> most of them know me at this point, but Oh, we are just gobbling as much food as we can for as long as we can. But that's the only the good one thing time that I cornered apex. with you, you took me back there and everyone's <laughs> like, you guys are not supposed to be back here. And you just look at me and you go eat quick. And we're just <laughs> scarfing down the food before they kick us out. Yeah. And actually the good food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It is. So I, I have some questions for you that aren't overly MMA. I mean, they are MMA questions, but not leading up to mm-hmm. the fight. Like okay. everybody always does the same stuff. One thing that I've always hated about the media is that it, it's always the same questions. How was the oh, fight yes. camp? Yes. What do you think of your opponent? How what did you, you train? <laughs> yep. What are you expecting? Are you healthy? Are there any injuries? Yes. Uh, who do you want to call yes. out next? Who was so, your all of- Who was your favorite five foot seven half Mexican training partner for this camp? <laughs> <laughs> So I, I've got some in, in just so the people know, so people can get to know you a little bit more. Uh, I'm curious mm-hmm. when, so you're Brazilian, you grew up in Brazil. Yeah. When did yeah. you, when did you move to America and like, why, H- how did you end up in America? How'd you end up in LA? And then how'd you end up training with the team who you train with? Well, uh, I was living in Japan, right? I lived there for, for a year and, um, the event that I was fighting for, uh, we were done. We were done with the event with the fight. So, uh, they actually, I was supposed to be back to Brazil to my regular life, but um, I, I, I want to fight more, and I want to like go around the world and find a like a different experience for me and in my MMA career. So I decided to come to US to, to US to fight the World Nogi Jiu Jitsu. So I did my registration, then I back to Brazil for one month. I took my visa, then I came to us to fight the, the word Nogi. So that's how I met Virginia and I started training at his gym in Ventura. And since then we just stick together, told him about my goals and stuff, and then he helped me. Okay, uh, how long ago was that? Uh it was December two thousand seventeen. 
Oh, okay. So that's, I mean, five yeah, years-ish. Five years, yeah. And what did you do, like, before you moved to America? Did you have a regular job in Brazil? Like, what did you do for a living? Or were you just training jiu-jitsu or what? Well, uh, I was doing my university. I graduated uh, physical education. I did for four years. Uh, actually, my dad was my professor in the, in the university. <laughs> was he harder on you or was he easier on you? No, no, he was harder on me. And actually, when I did my final exam, I, I had to present it for him. I was doing some strength and jiu-jitsu. That was uh, my my 10. And uh, I was crying. So actually, he, he gave me a nine because I couldn't stop crying. <laughs> <laughs> are, you a, are you a good public talk. speaker? Well, that day I was not good. <laughs> <laughs> But that is I can, awesome. Actually, I'm getting better. And uh, I was teaching teaching judo in a, in a school for kids. So I was getting paid for teaching judo. And I was training every day. Okay. Now, you, yeah. you train with Franchina. Were you a black belt when you moved to the U.S. or did you get your black belt from him while you were here? I was judo black belt and uh, I was purple belt when I in got In jiu-jitsu? Okay, yes. nice. Um. And Frangina, he's got a lot of like kind of, he, he's got the stars over there. He's got Glover, he's got Cooper, he's yeah. got these wild. How is it training with those people? Like, do, are they in a lot? Have you seen them a lot? Is it like, I mean, do you get like a bunch of the stars and the LA people in the gym? Like, what is it like with all those people? Well, uh, Jeff is more around, so he's always come to the gym uh, show us some techniques, help us with training. Uh, actually, he was there when Brandon uh, was visiting us. So, um, yeah, I have been learning a lot from Jeff. Actually, uh, all his leg lock games, uh, he taught me a lot. So, yeah, I'm very thankful, thankful him for that. And uh, and Bill, uh, Bill, he doesn't come much uh, sometimes, but we have been training in his backyard on his house. A uh, couple times. <laughs> so, yeah, we have been learning a lot with these people. Yeah. Are they as crazy as we would expect them to be or crazier? Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Craziest. <laughs> I love it. Um, he, he lived up to everything that I was hoping he would be, Jeff. Yeah, Good. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know. So, so another question I have is in this – may everyone on the planet may know this in – if everyone has asked you this, I am sorry. Mm -hmm. It's okay. <laughs> How do you get the baby shark nickname? Well, so uh, we have this coach at the gym. His name is James. And uh, all the time when I show up to the class, he say, oh, the baby shark is here. Because I think I, I'm the smallest girl. I'm always trained with everyone. Can be bigger guys. It doesn't matter. I'm always on the mat training with everybody. And... um he always come a baby shark because <laughs> I always go now, hard. <laughs> at what, now, who was the first one to go do, 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 do? Oh, yeah. Who did that the was song Vanessa. first? Um, uh, Van Vanessa. She, oh, put it, she put it in her Instagram and she started to sing it, the baby shark. And uh, she public in the Instagram. And yeah. <laughs> okay, well, good. I, I can't We're gonna speak have to too loud it. about that one because she's around here somewhere and she'll, uh, she will hear this. <laughs> <laughs> have to chime in. Um, and, and then, so just some other random questions. I, I want to know, just as a fighter, okay? So everybody okay. is, you know, after after fights, everybody asks, you know, Rogan, whoever's interviewing, what's next? Who do you mm -hmm. want to fight next? Like, I mean, part of that is who this fight would be. But like, if you had your dream fight, you know, a lot of people okay. in boxing anyway, it's like Madison Square Garden for the WBO championship, you know, uh, like WBO, WBC type of stuff. Like, what is your mm -hmm. dream fight? Would it be in an arena in Brazil? Would it be Madison Square Garden? Would it be in Vegas? Like, what is your dream fight? Who are you fighting? Is it on pay-per-view? Is it on a certain channel? Like, in your, like, mind, what is the the biggest best dream fight that you could ever have that's a great question because uh i think i never stopped to think that i don't think i have like that dream oh i really want to fight in the arena of course i have goals that i want to fight in brazil i really want to fight in abu dhabi in japan again 
but it's not like uh, I dream about that things, you know. I I really wanna my biggest dreams is is be a champ. It doesn't matter where or who. Um, I just dream and be a champ. And I have the goals to fight in this place, but it's not like always oh, my biggest dream ever. Okay. Just, yeah. Now I'm gonna help you out with this dream right here. <laughs> Cause you said Brazil, Japan, Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Hey, look, you might want to fight in Brazil and Japan, but we have fought in Abu Dhabi oh, a few did? times. You do not <laughs> want like no, you don't you think you want to really? go to Abu Dhabi. You do not want to go to Abu Dhabi. It was the hottest, <laughs> most humid place. Maybe it was just because we were in quarantine, but man, if anything Probably. was like what we had to do in quarantine in Abu Dhabi, you can cross that one right off your list. I made it easy <laughs> for you. Done. All right, Brazil, Brazil it is. Okay, like I'm, 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 I'm crossing that on my list. <laughs> can, can I Thanks. ask one more, I guess, uh, yeah. similar to that question? Go. Uh, after your career, right? So uh, Nate Diaz just, you know, his last fight on this contract, and now he wants to switch to boxing. So oh. maybe after your career, Nate Diaz style, would you ever do like a celebrity boxing match? And uh, if so, who, who would you fight? Yes, yes. I want to do, maybe when I'm still fighting MMA, when I get, when I get my belt or something, but I do want to do a professional boxing match and I would challenge a King Kardashian. <laughs> oh, I like that. You haven't like seen her that. on the mitts though. She can, she can crack. Yeah. Yeah. I heard about it. And I think that that'll be very like, like a money fight or some entertaining fight that everyone, everyone wants to watch it. Yeah. Kim actually watches the show, so she will yeah. probably hear this and we can start getting the, uh, the negotiations started. Yeah, I'm down. <laughs> uh, okay, so another question. Let's get into fight week. Let's get into fight week. Okay, and okay. I want to ask the questions that people want to know about the fight, and that is after weigh-ins, what is your go-to meal? What do you crave during – like what you can't – you have to diet right now. After yeah. you weigh in, and it could be either weigh-in day – or after the fight, so you can really splurge. What do you, mm -hmm. what do you want to eat that you haven't been able to eat during fight camp? Ice cream. What kind? <laughs> I want to eat uh, crimson cookies, Oreo ice cream, all kind of cream stuff. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, man. That's I, you know I actually do have one other question because you know. I, Brandon was asking me like, Hey, what do we ask her? What do we talk to her about? And like I said, I don't really want to talk fighting cause that's not yeah, fun. I want to yeah. talk human mm -hmm. stuff because yeah, 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 people yeah. see a fight. They do all the same stuff. If you weren't fighting like today, you're like, Hey, I'm out. I'm not fighting anymore. Okay. What would your dream job be? What would you do for a living? If you, you retire for, you know, tomorrow and, and, and you're now working as a normal human, not like, Hey, I'm a, superstar movie actress or I'm the president of the United States. Not to say those aren't things to do, but like okay. what what it has to be can can be above a fighting? Can be fighting. No, it can be anything you want. It can be anything you want. Um but not okay. like but just a so normal job. Coach? Like if you had a normal job, I, what would I, it be? I will be a I will be a jujitsu coach. I okay. I have a gym and I will, I will coach. Yeah, for sure. I I love to teach. I love to coach my students. If I had my more time, I would dedicate more for them because I love to see them growing up. I love love to go to the tournaments, uh, cheers for them, uh, help them get better every day. So yes, I would definitely be a coach. Okay, now would you yeah. coach adults or would you coach kids? Because kids to me are the hardest thing in the world. Do you like coaching it's kids? Super hard. I do like it, but man, it takes me a lot of energy. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it's rough. I don't know how. If, if like, I had they're... my gym, I would only only jujitsu. I would I would teach the kids. I really would love you? the kids. Yeah, there's yeah. like uh, there's like angel wings coming off of your back right now because only saints <laughs> and like Mother Teresa can teach kids like jujitsu. Like, that's amazing. So. All right. Yeah. Well, thank uh, you, Brandon. Do you have any other questions for Tabitha while she is? I just on have. I just have one. Fights? One more question. Yeah. And, uh, I think this is a question that we all want to know because you know stereotypes they they rule the world. You know, everyone has a stereotype, and I, I needed to know. Uh, you are Brazilian, and you do jujitsu. How much acai do you eat per week? <laughs> Oh, seven days a week, uh, in the week, every day. That's the bomb. That's real. I call, that's real. <laughs> do you, do you, you really have do a you... favorite? 
no, I do. I have like a routine. Every time after jujitsu, we go to acai. <laughs> and what is the, what is your favorite place, acai place that you go to? Yeah, we go, uh, Frangian has a acai store, BB Acai. And uh, everybody goes down after training. All the gym comes down. We hanging out. We eat acai. It's, it's already part of the routine. <laughs> I love it. Right. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I, I tell Brenda that's my bone, but that's my steroids. Is the acai. Hey, careful, careful, yeah. careful. It's fight week. Careful, careful. Yeah. Usada is going to be knocking on your door at 6 a.m. Yeah. As soon as this is uploaded, they're going to be like, hey, she was talking about Bomba and steroids. Like, we're, yeah, we're banging down we the door. We're in. There. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We thank appreciate you guys it. for having me. Yeah. I appreciate it. All right, you guys. So that was Tabitha Ricci, Baby Shark, coming on, just chatting. I didn't want to do fight stuff. I didn't want to do, you know, predictions, any of that stuff. Get to know people. Have some fun. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all we got right there. Let's get into this card, Brandon, because uh, we are 20 minutes in, and we haven't even talked MMA yet. So let's get into this. Do you have anything else you want to touch on before we dash into this card? Nope, I've got a clear conscience. So let's uh, let's go ahead and dive in. Let's do it, um, man. We've got the first fight of the night is Randy Costa and Guido Canetti, and I have a bone to pick with this fight. Do you know what it is by some crazy chance? Like, what is wrong with this fight happening right now? Uh, is there some some kind of conflict going on in Argentina? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it's Venezuela. Uh, I think it's Argentina. I think we're all right. No, I've got a bone to pick with this because we now know who Randy Costa and Guido Canetti are. And it would have been better to have this fight two fights ago when we didn't know who they are. And it would just be amazing. And my worry right now with this fight is that Randy is a little bit more tempered because he's kind of gassed out and kind of blown his wad a little bit. And Guido Canetti... We've actually seen him a little bit more tempered in that Chris Matino fight in his last one. And gosh, if these guys fought a couple fights ago and they were just all balls to the wall, it would be glorious when somebody died. It would be like the first death in the cage. Like it would be one of those like wild fights. And that is what I want to see. We'll have to settle for it now. But um, I mean, we've seen Costa, we've seen Kennedy quite a bit. Costa, rewatching him, I, I, I envisioned him as more crazy and wild and just swinging for the fences and kind of blowing his wad, especially in that Adrian Yanez fight. And, and he actually wasn't as bad as I remember him. He was a lot faster than I remember him, better head movement than I remember. Um, I didn't like that he made such big movements defensively because I think that's what wore him out. I think he's so athletic and so dynamic that he was – doing more than he needed to. Uh, but for the most part, I, I like him. I think he was actually really solid. And I don't, I do think that he blew his load a little bit in that Adrian Yanez fight. But I think a lot of it was actually Yanez adjusted. And you hear the commentators talking about it is he started jabbing. Yanez started jabbing and that really shut down the offense of Costa. And, and then he just started ripping him, going to the body and, and he really came on well. Costa did fade, but not as bad as I remember him. He, he wasn't as like just swinging and going. It wasn't like Leo Vieira or uh, Leo Santos over uh, Clay Guida type of stuff. And then on the other side of that, of course, we have Kennedy. He's like 68 years old, kind of backs up, backs up, throws hard kicks and just swings heaters from the, you know, from the rooftops. Um, man, I, I like Costa here. I, th I think Costa is going to be a little bit more tempered and a little bit more relaxed, but hopefully not too relaxed. I think he's going to sharpshoot Guido Canetti, and I think Canetti will will eventually swing and fall into something kind of dumb. What's what's your thought on this fight? Yeah, I think this is. Uh, I think <laughs> I, I just feel horrible going back in on Randy Costa because I, I took <laughs> such a stand on him the last fight, and uh, that's the one that will always stick out into my mind about just like the worst bet and worst logic that I have ever made in my whole life. And I was counting on like uh, Tony Kelly to have this like bad chin at thirty five, only because I had trained with him when he was cutting like crazy weight, and like I really went out on my shield on this one, and that was top 
two most embarrassing like takes and things that I've ever had. So now dipping back into Randy Costa, I feel like like dirty and I feel embarrassed. And I still think this is like the most golden matchup he could possibly have. I think this is like the easiest fight for him and is probably one of the best spots on the card. He's so much taller. He hits hard, crazy angles. Uh, you know, he's got cardio problems, but so does Guido, Guido Canetti. Like Guido Canetti's smaller than I am. Like Everything lines up for Randy Costa here. And uh, I, again, I feel dirty saying it, but I, I think this is a great, great spot and we can make some money here. I, I agree with you 100%. Yep. I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> I don't. I hate it, but I love it. You know? No, see, I, I, I we don't. You can only choose the matchups Costa... that's in front of us. Exactly. Exactly. It, that's all we can do. If this was a better fighter in front of us, we probably aren't choosing Randy Costa, but it's not. It's Guido Canetti. The dude's tough. He's old. Um, I mean, like you said, we can only talk about the fights in front of us, and, and which is what we're doing. So next up, we've got Julia Stoliarenko and Chelsea Chandler. Give us your thoughts on this women's matchup. At 100, is this at 185 or is this 205? Be nice. Uh, be nice. <laughs> well, I think it's actually okay. at a, a catch weight of 140. Yes. Okay. Be nice. So a few, a few notes here, uh, in a few weeks, I'm going to be going to Costa Rica and I may or may not see Yulia the whole time I'm there. So, uh, we have to tread light on this fight because otherwise she will whoop my ass and I will not be happy with that. Um, but I know, I know both of these girls really, really well. So you and I, we've had a long history with Yulia Stolyrenko we love watching her fight because she offers a lot of great stuff. She's super, super tough. And then on the other, uh, the other side of the coin, Chelsea Chandler, I, I, I love me some Chelsea Chandler. I think this girl is gangster as they come, uh, super gangster. Uh, my profile picture on like every social media for a long time was, uh, Chelsea Chandler and her do rag. I just thought it was, it's, it's just gold. If I could find the picture again, believe me, this would be Chelsea Chandler fight week with the do-rag. I love it. Um, but from an actual technical uh, technical standpoint, a couple things here. So to me, these girls are actually very similar in a lot of ways. Uh, I think they're both big, physical, aggressive. I think neither of them have the best cardio. Uh, both of them are very grapple-heavy and kind of squirmy in the jiu-jitsu. So Stolyarenko obviously has got the arm bar. But I think her traditional jiu-jitsu is very solid. And I think that uh, that Chelsea Chandler, she's a purple belt in jiu-jitsu, right? But we talk about purple belt jiu-jitsu is that kind of crazy, take risks, like always moving kind of style. And that's exactly what Chelsea Chandler is. I don't think she's as solid and rigid as like uh, Jessica Rose Clark is. So I, I think that uh, Chelsea is good enough at jiu-jitsu and squirmy enough and game enough to avoid uh, Yulia's arm bars. And I really think it's going to come down to the stand-up. Now, in the stand-up, I actually was a lot more impressed with Yulia uh, than I thought I was going to be in her Alexis Davis fight. Her punches were actually a lot cleaner than I had always remembered. They were straight. They were clean. They were aggressive. I remember her having pretty decent cardio issues. And it, she almost reminds me of a, like a, a, a Drikus Duplessis, where he looks like exhausted, but he keeps fighting really, really hard. So what is he actually? So, and I feel the same way about Stolyrenko. Uh I think this fight is is very interesting for a few things. Now, this is a side note. I had read on your uh, Patreon breakdown earlier that she's a Caesar Gracie girl. Um, when I was doing my research for that fight, I had commented on the Invicta Instagram. And somebody, uh, I can't remember even who it was. I don't even know who it was. Some random person said, hey, before you go crazy on the Caesar Gracie thing, uh, she actually got kicked out of our gym and everybody hates her. Uh so she's no longer Caesar Gracie. And I thought that was very interesting. I don't know the validity of it. Again, it's some random Instagram account. But from the looks of it, it didn't look like she was training at Caesar Gracie's anymore. Not with the Diaz brothers, not with Caesar Gracie. She was training with like Leslie Smith in like some random small gym. So, you know, this this kind of uh this kind of narrative that she's a big Caesar Gracie girl and and all this, you know, may, she maybe have come up with that, but I'm not sure if that's still where she is and what she's doing. Um, now the weight thing is really interesting. So Chelsea Chandler, uh, can't make weight. So she asked for 145, and in order to keep the fight, they settled on 140 pounds. So that's something interesting too. Now, Chelsea Chandler of old and Invicta, man, 
killer, like some brutal, brutal hands. Like she's got that swagger boxing and she is nasty, fast jujitsu, good hands. And I would say Chelsea Chandler all day. Her last fight against Courtney King, man, I had enough to, to, to fix world hunger on, on Chelsea Chandler. And I thought she looked awful. Uh, it was kind of a close fight for what it should have been because Courtney King is not very good. Chelsea should have run through her and Chelsea looked slow and tired and bad cardio. Um, and then fresh off that performance, the UFC signs her and they give her a really favorable matchup in Leah Letson and they want her to kind of be that star right now that the Diaz brothers are phasing out. We got this new 209 represent do rag girl. And uh, I'm sorry to, to go on this for a little while. Um, it's, it's a very confusing matchup for me. And I think this is lined very appropriately because honestly, I think, you know, professionally, I think Stoli Renko is the much better person. She's super game. She's fought much higher level competition. Uh, I, I think her punches are probably cleaner and straighter. I think if we get an in shape Chelsea Chandler, that's a problem because she is not afraid to fight and she's got sick hands and good enough jujitsu to avoid a lot of things. And she's just a dog. Um, I, I think the UFC knows what they're doing. I would slightly give the edge to Chelsea Chandler. I've been back and forth on this one all day because I'm more impressed with the uh, recent film of Stoli Arenko versus the recent film of Chelsea Chandler. But I, I don't see why the UFC would do a super signing to have her come in and lose right away. They were going to put her in the 145 division, you know, all these things. They didn't put her through contender series. They didn't, you know, sign her short notice. They gave her a full camp signed her, want her to come in. I can't imagine that they'd want her to lose here. So the script writers are going to tell me that Chelsea Chandler wins. I think it's going to be a very close fight, but I, I, I'm going to slightly lean Chelsea. So, you know, barring cardio, which we don't really know. I mean, because, but, but you said it, Chelsea Chandler, she's not coming in short notice. She's had a full camp. You would assume that a full camp making your UFC debut means you're going to train your ass off. And, and you would do, hope, you know what I mean? You'd hope so. And I can't like, do you remember when it was a uh, Maria Agapova and she was like a plus 200 and I was like from the rooftops, Maria, Maria, Maria. And everyone's like, you're an idiot. She's on Maria, drugs. She's Maria. this. Like Carlos Santana. Keep singing. Keep singing. <laughs> um, but everybody was like, oh, well, she's on drugs. She got kicked out. She this, she that. And she had a performance of her lifetime. So we can't, I can't take all of the peanut gallery seriously because again, you, like you said, that troll account, maybe it was a real person. Maybe it was just some hater. I think it maybe, was real. I asked about it. I think it was real. No, I mean, maybe she was kicked out. I mean, maybe she was kicked out, but we don't know the details that surround that at all. So we, we can only go on the, the bets and the fights unless we really know that stuff is substantiated. And Stoli Renko, I've been very complimentary of her in the past um, when others have not been, you know, like it's arm bar bust. And I've said, no, she's actually tougher, her cardio, her this, her that, whatever. Um, you know, outside of the arm bar, what actually worries me about this fight at all is the way that Chelsea Chandler, and I said this on the Patreon, I believe she she's a southpaw and she really heavily favors that rock back to her back leg. And when she rocks back to that back leg, Stoli Orenko can fire that right high kick because her opposite stance. And Stoli Orenko will regularly fire right kick, right hand, or right hand followed by right kick. And I don't know that she has the fight IQ to like really see that and do it while she's moving back like that. I don't know that she's going to read that. But I do like Stoli Orenko. I do think she's tough. Chelsea Chandler, if she shows up and just fights, she's going to murder Stoli Orenko. She has a really, really, really good straight left. Um, she has a lot of power in it, and then she follows it up well with big meat hooks. Um, I really I love like her. watching her fight. Oh my She's gosh, sick. I She's love watching nasty. Her. I love watching her striking. I love when she drops girls. She straight up Diaz is them. She straight up waves them on hands in the air. F you, let's go. I really like her. We can only go like we just said about Costa. I really like her. We we can only go on what we can go on. After this fight, we're really going to know, does Chandler... But, but see, this is the thing. These odds are so close because people are watching the the last tape. They're, they're looking at the missed weight. They're looking at all these what ifs. If she goes out there and actually trained her ass off and looks good, we're not going to see 
lines like this for a while. Wow. So I like Chandler here, even if it's by just a little bit, man, I like Chandler. I like Chandler. I like Chandler. And, and at these lines, I think it's a great, I think it's a great purchase. Please nobody tell Yulia about this podcast because I want to have a good vacation and uh, I really like her as a fighter. So, you know, it's just, it's just a tough fight. It's just a tough fight. It's a coin flip fight. Yeah. All right. All right well, next on. up, we've got Max um, Grisham and Philippe Linz. And uh, Grisham is 32 and 9. Um, he is 38 years old. And Philippe Linz is 15 and 5. And he is 37 years old. Um, these guys are, gosh, I mean, you want to talk about age. Well, they're both old, so that negates itself. And when Philippe Linz first got into the UFC, um, gosh, who was it? Um, it was Orlovsky, right? Was that it? Yeah. It was watching him against Orlovsky. He looked good. I mean, he, his hands were sharp. He was, I don't know if he just came off that PFL juice and hadn't quite gotten off it all the way or what. But he looked good. He was fast. He was dynamic. He was in your face. His hands, like he had a good guard. He looked solid. He would shoot. Like he wasn't bad. I mean, he lost to Orlovsky, but so have a lot of people. Um, lately, though, if you look at him against the Prachneo fight and even the Tanner Bozier fight, his hands have gotten like wide and floaty. His stance, he's not narrow. Um, he, he's kind of wide as well, so that inside leg kick is there. He's not going out there just swinging for the fences with, with hate and that youngness. And so he's, he's not an overly technical striker. He's not an overly technical wrestler. And so if you're not going to use like these big punches and you're going to try and out technique people, well, that's not a good idea. Like if you don't have the technique, you just got to throw caution to the wind and, and throw heaters. And generally when people get older, they stop throwing caution to the wind and they're a little bit more reserved and a little bit more technical. Um, you know, and that's that's the Philippe Lin side of it. And on the other side of it, we have Maxim Maxim Grishin, who is really, really technical. This dude, his stand up is solid. Um, I mean, he has a good chin. He his footwork is great. He has a great jab. Um, his wrestling defense is phenomenal. I know Maxim Grishin really, really well because Jordan Johnson fought Maxim Grishin multiple times in the PFL, and I trained Jordan for that. It was a big deal. Um, you know, we beat Maxim, gosh, I th think it was twice. You know, I think he fought him three times, one-on-one, -on -one, whatever. Um, but we ended up beating him really close fights. The guy is really, really good. My two biggest knocks on him, one, of course, is his age, but they're both old. And Grisham has a good chin for being that old. He doesn't take a lot of damage. He has really good head movement. He has really good reads. He has really good eyes in the way that he sees stuff and pulls punches and fires. My main issue is with Grisham is that he, his output, he doesn't have a huge output. Um, I don't know that that's going to matter here, but, but in other fights, if, if somebody was, uh, who's the, uh, the guy, the other guy that fought Orlovsky, um, give me one second. I'm going to look. Carlos um, Felipe. Cr yes. Carlos Felipe. If he was fighting him, I'd go, ah, oh, man, the volume is going to be an issue because Carlos Felipe is going to be in your face. He's going to do it. And, and even if he's not landing a lot, volume is going to be, be there. That's that's not this fight. Um, I, I love Maxim Grishin here. I think when I talked about it on the Patreon, he was minus one eighty. Like, gosh, that may as well be plus five thousand to me because I think minus one eighty with Maxim here is is the steal of the century. Well, I'm not going to say too much about this one. I really tried taping this one, and my mind just started getting mushy. I couldn't I couldn't get through the tape on this one, and. I know – see, I had to ask around, and I, I know that Grishin uh, is, is who everybody likes. I haven't heard one person say uh, Linz. I weirdly like Linz's hands. I weirdly think he's pretty technical on the feet. I, I like a lot of the things that he does. Uh, you got two old guys with – neither one has the best cardio. Uh, I, I guess I'm just going to follow you on this one and say Grishin, but if I had a big Grishin ticket, I think I'd have a nightmare the night before and I'd wake up pretty nervous. And I don't know why. There's no rhyme or reason. I don't think that, you know, Linz is substantially better than him in, in, in any area of this, but um, it's just a weird fight to me. It's just a weird fight to me. I'll probably just take your recommendation and play Grishin, Grishin money line there. I what do you really, think about an over in this fight? 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Over one and a half, over two and a half is, is really solid. Over one and a half, depending on the book, the odds, what you have over two and a half, you know, again, I, I love them both. I really think Grisham is really, really technical in all aspects of the game. I really like him. Uh, and, and I don't think he has horrible cardio. I think, I think he had bad cardio on his debut because it was on short notice. Um, but man, I, I thought he looked great against Will Knight. I, th- I, I like Grisham, you know, again, outside of being old and, you know, that's, that's really it. All right. What do we got next? We've got your former golden boy, Brandon Allen fighting, uh, Christoph Jotko. And before, I mean, you, you get into this, I mean, I mean, this will be yours, but I just want to say one thing about this fight. I think this might be the, cl- just the most closely contested tight matchup on the card. Maybe you disagree with me, but I just, I think this is such a competitive close fight. Uh, I'm really curious about this fight uh, as a fan on a technical level. I, I am too. And here's, here's why I am too. Uh, I used to love B. Allen and I called B. Allen against Puna Soriano when nobody in the world gave him a shot. And mm-hmm. I said, there's a lot of things that I like about, uh, about B. Allen and he looked great enough. That was the, that was honestly the best fight he's ever, ever, ever had. He looked phenomenal in that fight. And then he's looked like a fat bag of milk every fight since then. And he's constantly falling over and he just looks horrible. He makes really, really bad decisions. And then you look at Jocko. He's the guy that doesn't make any bad decisions. He is constantly a nothing burger but he has a jab and he just doesn't fuck up and that will take him so far and he's won so many fights by just doing literally nothing but the basics and just not making mistakes so to me these guys are on two opposite ends of the spectrum where i don't think jocko is overly talented but he doesn't make mistakes and brendan allen is super talented but makes non-stop mistakes and so you know typically i would just be like okay well jocko's gonna win this easy but the style matchup is really, really different. And I think that's where you're kind of talking about it's going to get competitive because Jocko has really good takedown defense. So, you know, what happens to Brendan Allen every fight is he looks great on the feet, standing. He's doing really, really well. And I don't know if he's panicking or what it is, but he just for some reason feels like he needs to shoot. And he shoots a double leg and sometimes he'll get it, sometimes he doesn't, and then he gets really, really tired. Um I don't know if he's going to be able to get Jocko down. Jocko just has good takedowns. And so that worries me for Brendan Allen's cardio. But maybe at the end of the day, he just decides, okay, we're just going to stand then. And in a standing matchup, I think this is a very close fight. I really think this is a close fight. Because Jocko doesn't do enough big stuff to really earn favor with the judges. And Brendan Allen looks so slick. He looks so clean when he strikes. He actually does a lot of things really, really well. He does the typical Sanford, like, you know, off the lazy jab, they counter with the two. He's got great check hooks. Like Brendan Allen does a lot of things really, really well standing. So uh, I guess for me, this fight is going to come down to game planning. What is Brendan Allen's game plan and how close could they make it? If if someone tells me he's going to try to wrestle for three rounds, I'm going to go Jocko. I just think he's got way better cardio, makes way less mistakes, and that's a pretty draining style. If Brendan Allen's going to strike, close fight. Very close fight. I like Brendan Allen. Um, Just out of principle, I guess my pick would be Jocko. But I I think uh, over 1.5 would be a very nice parlay piece here. Over 2.5 will probably be a nice parlay piece. Um, Yeah, that's what I got on that one. I I guess I would lean Jocko, but... uh, I, I think this is a close one. Yeah, you hit a lot of the points that I was going to talk about. Like, Brennan Allen is so skilled. We were watching him fight uh, earlier. Gosh, who is he fighting? Oh, Kyle Dacus. So uh, Eric Anders fighting Kyle Dacus. We were watching tape on Dacus and Brennan Allen. And you said it. Brennan Allen is so talented. And you want to know what it is? So what I think he does panic in there. I think he tries to, I think he's not comfortable being in there for 15 minutes and he's always overly looking for the finish. And because he overly looks for the finish, the, the, first of all, the way that he looks for the finish is with jujitsu. And that is not always the best idea. It doesn't because, work. Yeah. It's not real. Well, it works when you, it works. And otherwise, when you don't land it, you're generally in a bad position because of it. And he was fighting for so much. If Brennan Allen had just stayed on top of Kyle Dacus and just beat the hell out of him, 
he would have just beat the hell out of him. But he made a very easy fight, very competitive because he kept chasing submissions instead of just beating on him. He made a lot of really good decisions. He made a lot of really good um, scrambles. He's very good. He just overly attacks and that, you know, opens him up to bad positions. On the other side of that, you said Jocko just, you said Brandon Allen's really talented, but makes bad decisions. Whereas Jocko's not talented, but he doesn't make bad decisions. And I have to a hundred thousand percent disagree with that. I think Jocko is phenomenally talented. I think he's one of the more technical guys we have in that division in the UFC. I'm sorry. I I should rephrase that before I get taken out of context. I guess I meant like athletically gifted, talented and technical. Yes. But like athletically gifted, maybe not as much. See, I I don't even think that I I think, and I I don't want to speak for you. I think what you're probably thinking or meaning, or when you're watching it, what you're like, ah, what is it about him? He doesn't do much. He's so inactive. He doesn't go out there and try to win a fight. He tries to not lose. And he just does enough. If he were to go out there and just throw caution to the wind, I bet you he would finish guys left and right because he's just that freaking good. He is just so technical everywhere, but he doesn't throw caution to the wind, and he's very, very, very reserved and calculated. And because of that, I think that gives other people an opportunity for these big explosive movements. And again, for Brandon Allen, for as good as he is, he makes he overdoes stuff, which makes fights closer than they should be. And on the other side of that, Jocko is so reserved and cautious that he makes fights so much closer than they should be. So I I think this fight goes to a decision. I think over one and a half, over two and a half is a freaking lock. I bet you it's probably a split decision, just depending on the judges. I really see a really close fight here. I'm with you. I've got to lean Jocko only because he is the better decision maker throughout 15 fights time and time, you know, just again and again and again and again. And what I think will happen if I can kind of read into the future a little bit, maybe I'm a hundred percent wrong here. I think Jocko is going to do a lot of nothing. He's going to keep Brendan Allen away with his jab. I think Brendan Allen is going to get a little anxious and frustrated and not panic, but try to overdo stuff and try and make something happen. And in doing so, he's going to shoot or he's going to swing or he's going to this or he's going to that. And that'll get defended and countered. And, uh, you know, I I lean Jocko here by not not by a crazy margin, but I, I, I think he's a smarter fighter. We have to we have to go Jocko just because of everything that we've ever said on the show, like every principle and everything that we've had. If we went Brendan Allen for whatever reason, it would just be like us abandoning everything we've ever talked about. So it would. I think we have to. Yep, cardio, fight IQ, jab, basics, all of the stuff go to Jocko. But man, it's a fight, so pff, shit. What do we know? Anything can happen. <laughs> yeah. Anything. All right, next can up, happen. we got Jesse Ronson versus Joaquin Silva. Um, is this me or is this you? Uh, I think this Uh, is me. I I think, yeah, yeah, it's you. Go ahead. Yeah, this is me. So when I first watched Joaquin Silva, who is 11 and 3, um, and then I I was watching Ronson. I don't know why. It was like I was kind of just watching a little bit of Ronson, and then I just touched on a little bit of Silva. And I was like, oh, Silva is just too athletic, too dynamic, too everything, and he's going to win. And then I was just watching more. Then I went back and watched a good amount of Ronson. Then I went back and watched a good amount of Silva. And and I completely disagree with my initial response and my initial thought. And (laughs) Silva doesn't do anything. He's just there. And I don't – he barely throws. He barely does anything. He's in your face. He's very fast. He's very athletic. And he sure as shit doesn't use any of it. And Ronson is just durable. He's sturdy. He's got a chin, um, rips body shots, and he won't die. And I think by just Ronson's – I mean, he, he has never shown any chin weaknesses or, or bad stuff. Even when he was on the ground with Hoffa Garcia, I mean, he was scrambling well a little bit. And then Garcia, you know, put it on him at the end. He had to, he had to get him out of there. That was a good fight. He looked good. Um, gosh, man, I, I think Ronson is going to be very durable. And just find his way in the pocket. He, he has heavy hands. He rips that body shot. Um, they're opposite stance. And, and I think 
man, I think, I think Ronson's going to get the finish here over a Silva who a stiff breeze would knock him out into a coma. I went through this. It's funny you you just said that cycle because I went through the exact same thing. I don't know why in my head I had like Joaquin Silva as like this guy that like nobody talks about, but he's actually super, super good. And I was like, man, if I had to fight a guy that was like him, I would hate my life for a long time. And then I like went back and watched the tape and I'm like, wait, he doesn't do almost anything well. Like he's just kind of there, like exactly what you said. And then I remember thinking Ronson's horrible because I picked Hoffa Garcia over Ronson. And I was like, I, I remember thinking, this guy sucks. He's so bad. And then I rewatched the film and I'm like, wait, I know that Rafa is good because I watch a lot of Rafa film and I think everybody thinks he's not good. And I know that he is, but Ronson's good. Like Ronson's solid. He's a lot better than I had remembered. Um, yeah, I, I like Ronson a lot here. I, I like Ronson a lot, a lot. I was throwing in some like early early week parlays, like Hail Marys, just on some random stuff. And I had Joaquin Silva in every single one. And then as I was watching it, I was like, oh, this is not going to hit. This is not going to hit because Silva is going to be the one to, to lose this. I, I like Ronson a lot. You know, uh, actually a couple lines that I like, and you can play these maybe inversely. Um, I like the Ronson decision, finish, no bet line. Because I think he can just, I mean, he could finish him too. I like the money line as well, but I think he can just put it on him, put it on him for three rounds. Joaquin will play guard and do stupid stuff while Ronson just puts it on him. And while, you know, Joaquin Silva gasses. And then you could play that the other way too. You could play like uh, Silva uh, finish and then a decision would be a no bet. I think I like both of those, but I'm way more in the Ronson, uh, the Ronson boat here. Yeah. See, I like the Ronson money line because I, I think. He could finish him. Yeah. Yeah. I think he can finish him. And the reason is the opposite of Brendan Allen is he doesn't panic. He is just fundamentally good and he won't panic and he will stick to what he's good at. And that is beating. And Silva up. gets chinned all the time too. So he gets, yep. So I, I like Ronson by finish here. I don't know what the, odd, well, I like Ronson money line. You may, if you want to get, man, the thing with the finishes though. Gosh, you always lose on the unders. You always lose on doesn't go decision. You know, over one and a half, over two and a half. You can almost always, not always read those, but they're a lot easier to read. I feel like every fight we're like, oh, this fight's not going to a decision. Oh, this guy's finishing. And then you're like, oh, gosh, like those are harder to play. I, I like Ronson money line. I could see him beating him up for three rounds, but I, I, I think, I think he's going to, get them out of there. Just take I, the I like money Ronson. line then. Just take the money line. We're yeah. good here. I'm going to put yep. a nice bet on the money line. All right. Next up, we have Jessica Penne versus Tabitha Ricci. So I'm assuming you're not going to say much on this because of Tabitha. We just had Tabitha on here. Who? I want to say one thing on this fight and that that is it. Um, I think Tabitha is individually better than Jessica probably everywhere. Um, the one thing that worries me about this fight is the, gosh, just the vetness of Penne. And what I mean by that is, I mean, Jessica Penne is 14 and six, Tabitha seven and one. I remember years ago, uh, you guys know uh, Chris Grutzmacher. You know, he's in the UFC. Like I I've known him since he was an amateur and I remember he, you know, he was very good back in the day and he was 1-0, 2-0. And he fought a guy named Joe Cronin, who is a journeyman, probably 10-9-ish, something like that. And Gritz is so much better than Joe, it's insane. And Joe guillotined him, you know, in, in the first round and, and that was that. And it was just a just some salty vet move that occurs. And, and what I hope doesn't happen is that Tabitha – her striking is decent. Her takedowns are decent. Her jujitsu is decent. And, you know, I'm, I'm just, I mean, whether it's good or not or whatever, that's not really even what I'm getting at. They're all good. Um, she doesn't mix them together. And Jessica Penne is, I mean, she's just an old salty dog and an old vet. So that is that. I like Tabitha here. Um, you know, I, I mean, again, we're not. I'm not even talking bet wise and stuff because we, we don't like to talk too much. I mean, you know her a lot better than I do. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not really invested in this, but 
you know, I like Tabitha here, but that if she, if Penny is going to have any shot of winning, it's just going to be like an old salty vet, just doing old salty vet dog shit. Um, not on a technical thing. It's going to be a dog thing. I barely know Tabitha, so I don't really know what you mean. I'm going to break this fight down to the team. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I guess a few a few notes here, okay? Because I, I did watch a little bit of, a little bit of film, and then obviously I've trained with Tabitha, and I know Tabitha pretty well. Um, I think it, it's hard when you see these old salty dogs and they end up winning against somebody they're never supposed to win against, i.e., when she fought Loopy. Um, I think a lot of times they have their one time, and that's it. Like they're going to beat this really hot prospect one time, and that's going to be the big rug pull, and then they don't tend to, to recreate it. And I think a lot of that's going to come from film study. And, uh, since I've known Tabitha, I, I, you know, I've asked her, do you watch film? Do you watch film? Do you watch film? And I remember sending her a few things, uh, that I had seen too. The one thing that really surprised me when, uh, Penne fought Loopy. Yeah. I, I guess I want to put it like this. I think Loopy is ultra talented. She's got all the skills, the cardio, she hits like a truck, she can wrestle. She's got all that stuff in the world, but she doesn't necessarily know how to fight that well. I don't think her jiu-jitsu is very good and I don't think she she knows how to uh she she knows how to kick and punch, but she doesn't know how to fight. And the one thing that she kept doing that was really surprising to me is for as good of a wrestler as Lupi is, she kept going with with judo. She kept doing hip tosses. She would get Penne on the fence and go hip toss. And then what Penne would do is just reach a leg around and then trap on her back. And that's how she just kind of was glue. And I remember sending Tabitha this because Tabitha has a, a long judo background. I said, Hey, uh, don't do judo, do wrestle. And she said, got it, got the mission. Um, I, I think that's going to be really important because at the end of the day, I think Tabitha's jiu-jitsu is excellent. I've trained with her, rolled with her. She's got great top control. Uh, she's got unlimited cardio. We, you know, we've talked on a few shows before. I've never seen anybody train like that and never get tired. I mean, you know, she's got a weird obsession with pushing her body to limits that, uh, you know, she, she doesn't know if she can reach yet until she tries it. So I think the cardio is unlimited. The dog is unlimited. And I, I had always talked about this. I think even before, uh, before even knew Tabitha, one of my favorite fights of hers was against Kel Kelsey Arneson in LFA. Uh, Kelsey Arneson is a mountain climber, big, strong lady. And Tabitha is small. She's five foot one. I think Kelsey Arneson is like five, five, about the same height as, uh, as Jessica Penney, but probably stronger. I mean, just strong. And what really impressed me in that fight is, you know, Tabitha didn't get the first takedown right away. It wasn't easy for her. She had to work two, three, four times to go, to go for it. So when we watch film, you know, for all of Tabitha's fights in the UFC, you know, not including the Manon fight, but the other fights, um, that was the fight that I'd always gone back to because she was relentless. It wasn't the first one. It wasn't the second one. It was the third, fourth, fifth, sixth takedown. She got him. She got her down and then she was able to have her way and she was super aggressive and unlimited cardio. So, um, I, I like Tabitha here. I, the one thing you, like you say, the old veteran tricks, I think that Penne has a lot of them, but at the end of the day, I'm going to take the, uh, the super athlete, 27 year old that's, that's up and coming versus the short notice, 39 year old. If Penne was a little bit more dangerous with the hands, I think we're having a little bit of a different conversation. She's got a good jab and she's got good front kicks. But also when you watch film, that's easy to prepare for. You know, she got her leg chewed up last fight. She's really susceptible to getting hit with, you know, things over the top. She doesn't have the greatest takedown defense, I think. And she's got a willingness to play with her jiu-jitsu. So um, for me, I, I, I think Tabitha is going to gonna cruise here and going to show the world, uh, you know, how good she is and how good she can be. Yeah. Two last things on Tabitha. One, her jujitsu is really good. I've rolled with her and she's, uh, I, mean, I don't know what she walks around at one twenty five ish. I mean, she can't be heavy Yeah, and her jujitsu is really legitimately good. Uh, and then the other thing that she does, forget about us knowing her or this or that. She does one of my favorite takedowns in all of MMA and it's her go-to. Is she pulls a single leg, she runs it, and then hits an inside trip off of the single leg. Amazing. I love it. I love it. I love it. One, I just think it's a beautiful takedown. I think it's effortless. But it lands you in the guard. And the you know it because you hear me say it all the time. I believe one of the hardest things in MMA right now is holding people down. More specifically, you get a takedown on the cage. People immediately turn, referee's position, fight the hands, get up, and then they turn. 
that is, I think the hardest position, hardest thing to do in all of MMA is keep people down on the fence. Originally, you didn't want to be in the card because people could attack you. And so people would pass. Now I tell everybody, stay in the guard, at least stay in half guard. But honestly, look, any, this goes for any fighter on the planet, not named Paul Craig. I would take all of my chances to be in the guard and then be able to arm bar or triangle me while I'm on top punching them. Any day of the week, I would take that against any fighter on the planet. I mean, again, not Paul Craig because he has a really, really good guard. There's there's only a few of them left. In, but, man, she goes right in the guard. It's fantastic. It's beautiful. Um, and, yeah. And just – just as an inside tip, uh, when, when we did train together, I, I, uh, I played guard a lot and, you know, I, I came up as a guard player. I was never a top player until I met you. And, uh, I, all I tried with her arm bars, triangles, guard stuff, tricky stuff. And, and she's got good situational awareness. So I don't really worry about, uh, about Jessica Panay catching her and anything from, yeah. from the guard there. All right. Next up on our list, because we still have a lot more, so we got to kind of fly through these uh, for time's sake. We have Alexia Lenick and Alir Latifi. Uh, give us your thoughts on – and this is the other side of the bracket of the old man geriatric thing that I said in the Patreon. Because you've got Alenic who's like 78, and Alir Latifi, who's like 68. And then you've got Maxim Grishin and Philippe Linz on the other side. So this is – is this a loser goes home fight? Uh, this is, I don't care fight. I, I mean, maybe they're probably going to both go home, probably both going to retire. Um, this is like the ninth time this fight has been booked and I still have not watched film on it. And I refuse. Uh, I know who you like in this fight and I'm going to probably choose the opposite just to be contrarian. I have zero evidence, zero film, zero, anything to back it up, but I'm going to choose a Lear Latifi just throwing big old meat hooks and being a, a nice bowling ball. Uh, and that's what we got for time's sake. So uh, I'm not overly opposed to that. I, people, a lot of people have asked me my thoughts on this fight. And I was like, why are we talking about this fight? Don't bet it. You guys don't bet it. Don't bet it. Don't bet it. Um, I'll give a little bit more. I mean, Alir is better everywhere. I mean, he, he probably, I mean, not, not jujitsu wise and stuff, but he's got a neck the size of a station wagon, you know, I mean, he's huge, but Gosh, he, he really is better everywhere. My only worry is that lately he has been doing nothing. And he just – man, with that Tanner Bozier fight, he really just stand up, didn't do anything. Tanner was kind of landing on him a lot. And then he would out-wrestle Tanner who had no idea how to wrestle. And honestly, Alir's wrestling was beautiful. He'd hit that single and golf swing <laughs> it. Snap. Oh, God. That is just – He can wrestle. A freaking thing of beauty. And then on the other side of that, I, gosh, I if this was two years ago, I would say Alir all day long, every day. Uh, but Alenic has a chin. Alir <laughs> is only like countering. He doesn't really throw much. And then Alenic just throws these big meat hooks. He's going to push Alir to the fence. He's not going to get the takedown. And then he's going to pull half guard and try and come out the back and, and do something. Uh I wouldn't be surprised to see him freaking wiggle his way out the back and do something. Um, like I said, man, Alir is better everywhere. And it, it wouldn't surprise me to see Olenek somehow get the win. But I'm going with don't touch this, you guys. Like, just abort. You're just going to be on edge. The second that, that Olenek comes up on top and he starts getting a little scarf hold, everyone's going to be holding their breath. And Ilir has no neck, so it's going to be painful, and he's probably going to tap. It's just like a horrible way, any way that you bet this fight. And I hate being that guy that throws out a fight. Like, ah, don't bet this one. But really, I mean, it's so unpredictable. guy. Like, this the, one don't, is a tough one to get. Don't, I mean, it's a coin toss. Like, I don't even know what the odds are, but – uh. I mean, if you just if you just want to pick the dog, if the whoever the dog is, there's good odds on it. Go for it. But man, this is not yeah, that's this a is not smart the fight way to bet to pick. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. Next up, we've got Mike Davis, Slava Claus. Um, let me see, Mike Davis. I don't know why I didn't know who he was much before he fought uh, Mason Jones, and. I mean, did he have Sadiq I guess he had a, and Mike Davis fight was incredible. It was one of the best contender series fights of all time. One it was amazing. Best. It was amazing. Um, and, and then you see him in that Mason Jones fight, 
that was phenomenal. And, and then on the other side of that, you've got Slava, who is just tough, you know, kickboxer in the pocket. Like you got to love Slava. Um, man, Mike Davis is athletic. He has really good boxing. He's got a chin. He's durable. But but the the difference with these two is Mike Davis can wrestle, man. He was taking Mason Jones down a lot and almost at will. Is that that hard? Is that that hard? <laughs> Come on. We just watched well, that last fight too in retrospect. No, but he, he was doing it really – th- they were good takedowns. They were I good, well-timed takedowns. And yeah, exactly. It wasn't wasn't – yeah, exactly. After watching Mason in his last fight. But, I mean, he looked really impressive. His hand speed, his body work. Everything about that fight impressed. Slava, of course, we saw him just get uh, out wrestled by, um, gosh, who is it? Diakasi? And, and we've seen that that is, I mean, that Mark Diakasi's wrestling is actually re- really good these days. We think of him as a kickboxer, but he's a really good uh, um, mixed martial artist. Yeah, exactly. He's a good mix, mixed martial artist these days. Um, Slava's best shot is a left hook and his left body shot. Um, He's best in the pocket when he's shelling up and framing and people are swinging on him and he counters them and he checks. He's good in the pocket. I don't think he's great outside of the pocket. I think he's chinny. Um, I I think for Slava to win, all of the right stuff needs to happen and he needs to like catch Mike Davis. And that's not a bet that I like. Like I I hate it when it's like, okay, yeah, the puncher has a shot. And it's weird to say that Slava is the puncher here, but really Slava needs to land some beautiful counter shot to to get this. Whereas I think Mike Davis can glide effortlessly on the outside and he can dictate when the fight goes to the ground or not. And we saw Slava after the first round in the Mark Diakasi fight dying of cardio from wrestling. And I think if Davis mixes in his striking with his wrestling in round one, I think a lot of what Slava is going to have to offer is going to be diminished. And I, I just don't see – it's not Dakota Bush here. You know, like that's that's who Slava made his debut against. And, and he clipped him, you know. And I, I think yeah, Mike Davis sure did. is – Right? I think Mike Davis is really good. I really like Mike Davis here. Um, I, I think he's going to gonna get the win probably by decision. But uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me to see like a TKO later in the second or third. I don't know how you would go any other way besides Mike Davis. And I understand, I understand like Slava could catch him early because Slava does have, you know, pretty good movement in the first, he moves his head well. And like you said, his, his pocket work and his body work is really, really clean, but Slava is, he's been chained in every fight. He's been out wrestled in every fight. He gasses in every fight. And then he somehow finds a knockout in every fight. Uh, I, I don't, see evidence and I don't see tape on how you could come to the Slava one without just going, Hey, he's an underdog. So I'm going to take him here. And I, again, I, I don't like that kind of betting. If he's a favorite, he's a favorite. He's a favorite. I mean, to me, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I really like Mike Davis. I think he's got very, very good hands. He's very clean. And I, you know, like you talked about in the Mason Jones fight, I was surprised to see his wrestling was as good as it was just watching Slava and being a fighter myself. I don't think you can keep that style up for three rounds effectively at all. And I'm talking about his striking style. Even if they didn't do any, any grappling at all, just the amount of head movement and footwork that Slava is doing, man, that's an intensive cardio style. It really is. Whereas Mike Davis is pretty basic boxing. He moves forward. He controls range. Well, he's got a good jab and he hits like a truck. That's a much easier style to keep, keep up than, uh, than the constant, constant, constant movement like that. And one thing that I like Mike Davis uh, does is he meets people head on and he meets people with punches. And I think that's a big problem for Slava. He's been rocked by Kenley St. Louis, Dakota Bush, Chris Duncan. I mean, he, he has been rocked by every single person. And now you get probably the, the, the heaviest puncher of them all to fight him. Uh, I, you know, odds this close. I, I don't see why, why we don't slam Mike Davis here. Yeah, you guys, Bet Online has uh, Mike Davis at minus 170 right now. I mean, that that's a good that's a good bet right there. Mike Davis, um, man, I, I like that. I like Davis a lot. And it, not only just in the spot, just as a fighter, I think he's really good. I think he's just very good. And 
he somehow slid under the radar. He hasn't you fought. You know what I mean? That, that's yeah. the only thing yeah, I can think of is true. he just hasn't fought. Yeah. All right, guys. Next up, we've got uh, Daniel Santos taking on John Castaneda. Give us your thoughts on this, Brandon. Yeah, so if I'm going to bring back the the, the list, uh, I, I got to revise it a little bit. There, there's a few names that have fallen off the list, and a few names that are going to go on the list. And I I got to put Castaneda on the list. Uh, we called him as an underdog last time, both of us against uh, Miles Johns, and he put a beating on him. I love Castaneda because you know exactly what you're going to get with him. He's a beautiful at switching stances. He's high volume. He makes every correct decision. I love me some John Castaneda. And in this matchup, he's fighting uh, Daniel Santos. The Was it the Willy Cat or Wiley Cat, whatever his name is? And he's a guy that's going to throw hard and throw bombs, but he doesn't have a rhyme or reason really for why he's doing it. He's a guy that, uh, and I say this a lot, there's a big difference between knowing how to throw punches and knowing how to fight. And I think Daniel Santos knows how to throw punches, but he doesn't know how to fight. He just kind of walks forward. I'm going to throw down. I'm going to throw punches at you, and we're going to see what happens. Whereas Castaneda is almost the complete opposite. He, he, I know he knows how to throw punches, but he really knows how to fight. He knows how to control. He knows how to win rounds. Like, I love everything about Castaneda. I, I love everything about him. I think he's one of the most dependable guys. I think the only way he gets, you know, he loses if he gets clipped. I don't think he's going to lose a decision to a lot of people in the world, right? He lost one to Nathaniel Wood, who is excellent. I don't think he's going to lose a decision at all. So I guess you could play that again a few ways. Play Castaneda, decision, uh, finish is no bet. I wouldn't take anything on the, the Santos side just personally. I, I, I like the Castaneda money line. I like Castaneda everything, everything for me. Man, I like Castaneda. I, I, I think I think you're a little harsh on Daniel Santos because I, I think he's – I mean, he's not overly refined, but dude knows how to fight. Like he is in there swinging, and he keeps up that pace for for a good amount of time. And he's got these weird off rhythm strikes, and the, you know he'll he'll kind of almost like throw a kick, and then he throws these wide change up head kicks, almost like C Rod does or or Ray Waters guys at, guys at our gym, where they throw these wide head kicks, and you think. Oh, it's going to be there really fast. And it takes almost longer than you thought it would because it's a different angle. And they end up landing just so much more effectively. And he does that really well. He also mixes up these weird elbows and spins. Like, but they're not like overly crazy wild that are just like sloppy that he's just throwing them. He really sets them up well. And he's got good power in his hands. He moves forward. He's in your face. He's a scary guy. I do like Castaneda, and, and I like what you said about Castaneda. Um, I, I think for Ca- – first of all, I, I'm going to go out and say that I think Castaneda is, should win this, but I am not overly confident, and I, I, I don't know that I would even bet money on it because Santos is really like kind of why I mean, he's just really unpredictable, and not in a crazy – You say he's like a wily cat? A wily cat. He might even be like a wily coyote. I don't know. Uh, but he's – He's good and he's dynamic and he throws a lot of stuff that can be very dangerous. The way that I think Castaneda needs to win this is with Santos just marching forward as much as he does, Castaneda's got to level change to sh- and shoot. He doesn't even need to get the takedowns, but if he just level changes constantly, that's going to force Santos to stop pressing forward as much as he does, and it's going to temper him a little bit. That's going to allow Castaneda to start using his footwork and his rhythm which is really good. He has really good lateral movement. He has a really good inside leg kick. Um, I think his hands are solid. I, I think Castaneda is a really solid guy. My knock on Castaneda is I, – uh, I'm going to pull it up right now. I don't believe – I mean, I guess he finished Eddie Wineland, but who hasn't at this point? Oh, yeah, yeah I guess he did finish Miles Johns too. All right, I, I lie. He, he is finishing people. For some reason, I was, I was thinking he was, he was a decision king. Um, I, I could see him getting something late in the third round if if Santos really really fades out, but he's got a level change and he's got to put Santos on his heels. Otherwise, Santos is dangerous when he's moving forward like that. So I like Castaneda. I hope they have a wrestling. I wouldn't even say wrestling heavy game plan, but a wrestling, um, you know, active game plan to keep him off of his keep him at bay a little bit. 
I like it. I, I think he will. I think he will. He mixes things up very, very well. He does. He does. Um, and, and for time purposes, we've got Sadiq Youssef, Don Shanus. Give us – I'm I'm cutting you – wait, this one might even be me. I don't even know. It doesn't matter. Like Sadiq right, is going to murder this guy. Yeah, so he's going to murder him. Right. The only other thing I want to say is I was looking at the lines hoping that Sadiq was like minus 500, and I was like, I'm still going to bet him. And he was like minus 1,200. Don Chanis yeah. got in last minute. He's going to get murdered. He shouldn't be there. He shouldn't be fighting Sadiq. Uh, and uh, Rayoni Barcelos and Trevin Jones. All right. Um, all right. We've got Rayoni who – he. I mean he. we've been on Rayoni – since we've been doing – since before. He, he's my favorite this. fighter. In in all of MMA, he's probably my favorite fighter. God, he's phenomenal. And that Victor Henry fight was brutal. I was there live just in <laughs> so awe. So was I. Staring. Well, was were crazy. you there? Oh, just staring like what is going on here? Barcelos is losing. Like what the hell? And Henry just looked amazing. Barcelos did not. And, and I wonder if that was – because wasn't that – Moved like three times in a row or two or three times in a row, something like that. It was moved one time. They pushed it back. And, and Victor had to told me the story why. And like the UFC, he like drove out there and had a car or something like that. It, it was it was crazy. And uh, I, I tell this a lot because I was out there with Vanessa. For, it was for her fight. And I remember looking at Victor Henry. And the dude didn't care. Like he, he just like had the most swagger I've ever seen in my entire life. He's about to fight this Brazilian legend who's like amazing at everything. And he's just like, eh, whatever. I don't care. And at that moment, when we were sitting in the back room, I went, oh man, Rayoni is going to be in trouble. Rayoni is going to be in trouble. This guy doesn't care at all. Like he doesn't care at all. And then, you know, we saw what happened. Yeah. I mean, Barcelos does everything well. If injuries didn't really set him off, you know, on the sidelines so many times throughout his career, this guy might have been champion at some point. Um, he's older now. What is he? He is um, 34, 35. Um, so he just turned 35 in May. I, you know, I mean, he does everything well. He does everything well. Beautiful striking, good rhythm. His takedowns are good. His takedown defense is good. His jujitsu is good. On the other side of that, we've got um, – who's he fighting? Trevin, uh, Trevin Jones, who is a lot better than y'all – like than we watch. In my head, he's just some of this like boom or bust type of guy, which he kind of is. But he's actually not bad. He's actually decent everywhere. His jiu-jitsu is not bad. His what, – what really impressed me with him against uh, – um, gosh, who was it? Let me pull it up. Uh, Mario Batista was – the the read Mario kept coming in in the same combo, the same combo, the same combo, mm -hmm. and Trevin picked up on it and ended up catching him with an uppercut. That wasn't like just some lucky punch. I mean, he he read it well. He did stuff well. Um, he, he's got who is he throwing uh, guillotines on? Sadyupak Kakramanov. He was almost finishing him in some stuff. He took him down, and Kakramanov got tired. Uh, but he's really not bad. He's really not bad. I, I have to go with Barcelos because one, I can't see him losing three in a row. I don't care how old he is. Um, and it just comes down to doing all of the right stuff. I think over the course of 15 minutes, Rayoni is going to do more of the right stuff than Trevin Jones. And as long as he doesn't get hit with some crazy wild haymaker punch where he dies, cause he could, um, you know, I think he wins this, but, don't sleep on Trevin Jones, and I'm not, I'm not as confident in this as I would have been. I mean, because Rayoni is he's he's fallen a few steps. He is not where he was a few years ago. I I, I think Rayoni should win. Um, but man, Trevin Trevin's a lot better than I think we give him credit for. I give Trevin a lot of credit. I give Trevin a lot of credit, and it's it's killed me. Uh, because we didn't give him credit in the Tamura fight. We didn't give him credit in the Mario Batista fight. And then we gave him way too much credit in the Saeed Yukub fight. I can't get Trevin Wright to save my life. So <laughs> I feel like whatever pick I make here, you guys do best by going the opposite. And we're going to figure out this Trevin thing eventually. He's either going to get cut or something's going to happen before I can finally get him right. Um, 
I, I have to agree with you, and I don't love it. I hate this matchup just personally because I do like Trevin a lot, and Rayoni's again like one of my favorite fighters of all time. Now, being with Rayoni for a week, you know, we kind of talk about uh, Alex Pereira sometimes how he looks like he's just made of like dinosaur bones, and he's just like so slow and just like oh man, you're like that guy's seen some things. Rayoni makes him look like a spring chicken. Like he just looks so freaking old and just how he moves. And the only person that's older than Rayoni is his dad, who looks like he is 95 years old and just moving slower than Rayoni. But when Rayoni's in there, he actually looks good. He's bouncing around. He does amazing things. He's high volume. I love me some Rayoni Barcelos. So uh, I, I think you're right. Unless Trevin can clip him, you know, I think the the volume that, that Rayoni fills up is going to be much more. He's got great leg kicks. He's got great striking. Uh, I think where he was getting caught in the Victor Henry fight is, is punches he didn't see coming. Victor wasn't stopping at one punch or two punches like Trevin does. You know, that's pretty easy to see and read and, and get out of the way of. But Victor was throwing one, two, three, four. And then when... When Rayoni thought the combo was over, Victor came back with another two, three punches, and he was landing those pretty pretty flush. He just never stopped and never died and never got tired. So, you know, I, I think this is just a much different fight. Trevin tries to see things a lot more. He's a lot slower paced. He's a lot more picking his shots than, than Victor Henry, who's just all dog. Those CMMA guys that are just all dog in your face. So uh, I, I like Rayoni a lot here. Not a lot here, but I like Rayoni to, uh, to get this one done. Yeah, it's funny because y- you want to say you like him a lot because that's what I wanted to say. Like, man, I like him a I've lot. I've always here, wanted like, to say that. Yeah. Yeah, but but then you, you can't quite like him a lot because of the last couple of performances. And then, uh, again, Trevin is not as bad as you think, and he is dangerous, and he is actually solid everywhere. It's almost like a, a watered-down version of Brandon Allen where you look at him and you're like, he's really good everywhere. He just makes these bad decisions and has these kind of holes that he kind of screws up. But – uh Man, just the the other thing about that, what you said is Victor Henry. Not only did he throw a lot of volume, he has this off rhythm, almost like boxing style movement rhythm that just, I, I bet if you're not used to seeing that, that is going to throw you off. If you're going against somebody like that for the first time in a fight, I bet that's a very hard style to to pick up on just right on the fly. Yeah, and he's going to win a lot of fights that way, man. He's a he is. dog dog. He's really good. Uh, all right, we are up to our co-main event, which is Randy Brown and Francisco Trinaldo. Um, give us your thoughts on these two spring chickens. Uh, well, one of them, but Trinaldo, I think, what is he, 44, 45? And he is – I, I got to pull up his record really quickly for you guys because um, he's 28 and 8. He is five and one in his last six. And those are, I mean, that's since he was 41, since he's 41 years old, since he was 41, he's five and one. Who in the hell does that? Amazing. And he's beat Bobby Green, John McDessie, Jai Herbert, Dwight Grant, and Danny Roberts. Like that's a pretty solid lineup. As a, as I mean, an old small man who's smaller than me, it's crazy. Yeah. Give um, us your thoughts on this one. Um, does he does well, he I, stave off Father Time or not? No, I don't think so, and I have no choice but to keep picking again. I mean, it would be hard on a show where we where we pick a winner every single fight. By the way, by the way, you, some people may be good at betting, but I've watched a few shows in this last week where people may be good at betting, but man, they're horrible on the mic, like just nasally drone, don't care, put no energy into it, no research, like just bad, bad, bad on the mic. So. You, you know, you guys think whatever you want of us doesn't matter to me. At least we can speak on the microphone clearly and maybe with some energy. Uh, it, you know, makes life a lot smoother. But uh, Francisco Trinaldo, he's old. I have to keep picking against him. I don't know how you could make a case for him. Although he looked really good in that last fight, which was in Phoenix. I was there for it. I got to watch live as he uh, as he drained thousands of dollars from my gambling accounts against Danny Roberts. But Danny Roberts always kind of had that weird chin and he was super hesitant in that fight. Uh, one thing about Randy Brown, and this may be for the good or for the bad. A lot of times he puts himself in danger. Uh, actually, I think that fight was in Phoenix too. I think it was on the exact same card when he was fighting, uh, um, what is it? Uh, chaos Williams. And he kept putting himself too much in danger and too close in the pocket against a guy who was a major power puncher. 
Um, but honestly, in this one, I just see the size difference being too much. I love Randy Brown's jab. I love a lot of the long punches that he throws. And uh, I, I think he's more willing to fight than Danny Roberts and a lot better chin than Danny Roberts. Uh, I think this is, this is going to be where we get the money back we lost from the Danny Roberts fight. It's funny you say that, that you're like, you have to always bet against Trinaldo at this point. And I was thinking the exact same thing. I was actually thinking, we talked about the, the Diaz Ferguson fight. And I said, I said, no matter what, you've always got to bet against Ferguson from here on out, no matter who else he fights, he's done. Even if he wins the next 10 fights in a row, it's still the wrong bet. And that's Trinaldo to me at this point. He has not, he and not has, that Trinaldo's bad. He's just small and old. He's small and old. And, and that is not great for fighting when you're fighting a guy who's tall and young. Like, you know, small and old doesn't beat big and young, generally, um, except for the last five out of six guys that he did. But anyway, that's beside the point. At some point, Father Time is going to come knocking. You've got to keep betting Father Time because eventually he is going to win. So, you know, separate from that, Randy Brown's jab, you said it is amazing. His head movement is amazing. He checks kicks really well. Now, I mean, he has toothpicks for legs. <laughs> Save really um, well. I don't know. But he does uh but you know, but he checks kicks, both stances, he glides around. Um if Trinaldo wants any shot of winning that's not just head down, throwing one big overhand and hoping it lands, and you know, that's it's like hitting a number on a craps, you know, table. Um he, he needs a kick because Randy Brown rolls his head and he's got this off, uh, off rhythm, off balance kind of boxing style that he kind of mixes in. And Trinaldo needs to throw middle kicks or head kicks because he's got to prevent that off rhythm movement from going too much. You know, that said, even with that, I, I just think Randy Brown's jab, I mean, it's going to be like a kid holding or, you know, like an adult holding their hand out to a kid. Yeah, I mean, it, he's just so much longer. But you said it. He puts himself so close in so much danger, but he generally does it in this weird lunging in, grabbing your neck, uh, trying to attack a standing guillotine instead of like fighting in the pocket, striking or clinching her knees. It's a weird thing. He's really good striker on the outside, has a good chin, has good movement, does everything really well. And then like lunge, uh, it's almost like he gets anxious and wants to like try and finish too much and like lunges in and grabs. So um, I hope he doesn't do that. He's beaten some really good guys. I think he's just getting better and better and better. I don't think we've seen the best of Randy Brown yet. And I don't think uh, Trinaldo is going to be the one to, uh, to pull it from us. So I like Randy Brown here. What are the odds on that? I don't even know. Um, yeah, they're not that great. Up. Are they not? Yeah. No, yeah. Like oh, geez. Or Randy Brown minus three thirty. Trinaldo plus mm -hmm. uh, two seventy. So I, I've taken a new approach to betting a little bit uh, because you know early in the year I was getting crushed on so many parlays and uh, <laughs> I posted the meme. Have you seen the meme? It's uh, it's it's not. Uh, oh, geez, I forgot. It's like. Uh, I'm messing it up now. Anyways, I'm trying to just win a thousand dollars on every bet. So, you know, even if it's crazy juice odds, I'm just throwing whatever to win a thousand when I feel really, really confident, like the Bellator card that was in, uh, in Dublin. And I'm like, okay, this is a setup fight. He's fighting a 40 year old, yada, yada. Okay. I'll put $3,800 to win a thousand bucks. And, uh, I know it's, everyone's going to cry and bitch about that. But you know, if I find a spot that I really, really like, it's been working for me very, very well. Even contender tonight, I find a spot I like, okay, boom, I'm going to do it to win a thousand dollars. Boom. Do it to win a thousand dollars. Instead of parlaying like nine fights or five fights or three fights or whatever, something always goes wrong in those. So I'm just doing that. And then uh, once I get that thousand dollars now, I'll maybe split it up and do, you know, a couple different parlays or whatever, but that's been working for me. And uh, you know, a thousand bucks, a thousand bucks. It's funny that you say that because I remember when you started betting, I told you stop doing so many parlays and bet money lines, even though the money won't be as much. And you're like, nope, nope, I'm betting parlays. Nope, nope, parlays, big money. Um, it worked for me. It worked for me until it didn't work for me. And you know, like you know, it's funny. Rayoni's on this. That was like one of those. Like I, that was one of those nights. I was like, I cannot lose this money, or I'm gonna be in some deep shit. And. Uh, and Rayoni lost and I lost everything. And I was like, wow, I'm in deep shit. So I was like, okay, let me take the last money in my last account. And we're going to go right back at it. And then I lost again. And I'm like, okay, this, you know, this, this has got to change. And did I learn? 
no. It took me till, you know, five winning bare knuckle events in a row and a little bankroll and a little this and that to be like, okay, now I have enough where I can just do singles on fights that I like and not hate my life so much. But that's the thing is I think people think the I mean, I mean, look at it investment wise, you know, if you have minus 250, I don't know, we'll say, and you put in, you know, you're really confident in that person to win and you put in, you know, say a thousand dollars to get, you know, 250 back or something like that. I mean, that's a 25% return, which anybody would love that over the course of a year for a good investment. You did that over the course of a night. I mean, that is really a solid return. And then you compound that again and again and again. And, you know, I like money lines. I, I don't like parlays. I say it in my Patreon stuff all the time. Mix and match stuff, trying not to do more than two or three legs on a parlay. There's just too much shit that can go wrong. So, but I'm also a little bit more, um, you know, uh, I'm not as uh, I'm a little bit more risk averse than you are. So, anyway, we've got our main event. We have Mackenzie Dern against Zhao Yan Yan um, coming up right here. And Yan, who did she just beat? She just beat, uh, or no, she lost to Rodriguez. But it was um, a close fight. I thought she won. Yeah, I thought she won as well. I, I really did think that she won. Um, just the volume. We say it all the time with women in MMA. Just volume, volume, volume. And Yan is just nothing but volume. She's just in your face, kind of shadow boxing for 15 minutes nonstop. Um, and then on the other side of that, who did? Okay, so Dern just beat Tesha Torres and um, lost to Marina Rodriguez. And, and man, that was a. I remember when she lost to that. I think you called Marina, and I thought Dern was going to win. And I thought Mackenzie's power and wrestling was going to to really do it and it didn't and, and the thing that gets me about mckenzie did you is, say mckenzie's wrestling no, well no just power and like that i thought that she would somehow find it to the mat and like scramble not not really okay. wrestling but i guess grappling you know i i should say but yeah no definitely definitely not the wrestling really that's my biggest knock on mckenzie is she for Can't good wrestle of, refuses to get better. <laughs> yes, I don't get it. I don't get it. I do not get it. Her hands have definitely gotten better. Um, she's more proficient with it. I, I just, why will she not wrestle? I, I've got to think that at some point Mackenzie is going to get this fight to the ground and find either a submission or some sort of a TKO against Yan. I, I don't think Yan's grappling and wrestling is going to be like good enough if Mackenzie really tries to do it. But if Mackenzie just tries to swing big heaters and haymakers, I wouldn't be surprised to see Yan just slip, evade, throw 27 shadow boxing punches and, and win a decision. So on this, I, I think Mackenzie is going to just use her grappling at, at some point over the course of 25 minutes. I think she has to, um, but I like the I, I like a McKenzie finish decision no bet on, on this one. That's the bet I like. I think I think I've got to go with McKenzie. I think that is the most logical choice to me given the skill set because I, I don't think that Yan's power is enough to really do a lot. She's a volume person, and I don't think her wrestling is going to be. I, I, again, I don't want to say wrestling. I want to say grappling at some point because I feel at some point Mackenzie will engage a grappling match, whether she's even pulling guard and will be able to find some success with grappling, whether it's by scrambling, pulling guard, or by some freaking chance of all the gods getting a takedown. But um, that's a skinny on that. I don't think we have to spend too much time on it. I don't, I don't care to anymore. What, what's your thought? Uh, I'm, a, I'm actually completely the other way. I'm completely the other way. Um, I, I, I understand the concerns with Jan. Okay. Carlos Sparza thing was dramatic and it wasn't that good. And it really wasn't that long ago, but I will say that Carla's wrestling, Carla can actually wrestle. And she's one of the few girls that can actually wrestle. She wrestled in college. She actually wrestles. And that's really how she wins fights is by actually wrestling. Uh, Mackenzie's not that. And I, I don't know, like, okay, the Tisha Torres fight was close. I think a lot of people thought that Tisha won. I had a ticket on McKenzie, so I was happy that I cashed, but, you know, it is what it is. 
she like did the weird guard pull jumping thing to the to the Kimura, and yes, she was. I'm glad she got it. Whatever. I don't think you can bank on something like that happening every fight. And one thing that I think Yawn is her movement is a lot better. She never stops circling and moving and and going crazy. Her in the Marina Rodriguez fight was super super impressive, and her hips look improved. Her just overall awareness looked improved. You know, in fights past, we've seen her just fall over. You know, Breeze rolls through. She's she's on her back and she's looked awful, but at least in that fight she looked good. She even got a takedown of her own and looked good on top. I just think that uh, I think Mackenzie trusts her jiu-jitsu way too much for for where the the game is in MMA. Now her jiu-jitsu is very good, but if she pulls guard, I mean, I don't see her being good enough off her back in MMA to to submit Yon. I think her path to victory she has to get on top somehow, some way, and that's where she can she can win this fight. But Honestly, I, I really like Yon to just to tear her up on the feet, to circle, to move. Um, we're going to see how this weekend goes, but I think that Yon is going to be a pretty big play for me. I just think she has gotten miles and miles and miles better. And all I know is I see, um, I see, uh, oh, sorry, my Siri went. Uh, all I know is that I see uh, Yon, uh, I'm sorry, Mackenzie out at ADCC spending the weekend in Vegas. While everybody else is training, who's been you know who's on this card, so uh, I I like Super Soldier Yawn here. That's where I'm going with this one. Okay, well there you have it, guys. That is not the longest we've ever done. Hour and thirty six minutes, I think, somewhere like that. With twenty so, minutes on a guest, we cruise. With twenty minutes on a guest, man, we flew through some of these. But good thing we had like a Sadiq fight and an Olenek fight that we just refused to talk about. Um, I, I think there's some spots on this card to avoid. I think there's some really good spots on this card. All right. That's another show. This is going to be the best one. We need 10,000 views on this one. 10,000 views, you guys. Like, share, subscribe, and watch five times each. Minimum five times each. We need all of you to watch so many more times that YouTube is going to think bots are coming in and taking over. So Free months we'll of Patreon guys. if you guys watch five times. All right? Five times. Show us the proof. I don't even know what the proof would be. <laughs> Uh, we love you guys. We'll see you next time. Uh, happy betting.